screen this or is this the whole side? Can we get the lights down in the back? Hey folks, I'm Mike Lehman and I'm a member of NextFab, the uh, local uh, makerspace, which is amazing and it's 21,000 square feet of hardware. Uh, by, sh uh, by show of hands, how many people are interested in attending a tour at 1 p.m. tomorrow, Sunday? Handful, okay, see that white piece of paper right there? Put your name, email, and phone number. Uh, and we'll try to throw something together and there you go without further to do dustin thanks mike so before we start the next uh and last session we have to thank our summit team here so these people make this work And the people not pictured on here, which are doing an amazing job all behind you, are Joel and Trey from Streambite. They're doing the live video and the recorded video, which will be up on our website in days. So please give them a round of applause as well. And I don't want to move forward again without seriously all of our revenue comes from sponsors and ticket sales. We have no idea how much we're gonna get when we start planning this every year. So every time a sponsor says yes, 300, yes, 400, we're like, yes, we can afford beer now. Yeah, we can afford brownies now. So it's really, really helpful to have all of your support. So thank you again.
So this next block is about the role of open hardware going forward. You're going to have a few amazing speakers, and then we'll end with a, a social hour. So let's give it up for Benedetta. Thank you so much for, for having me. Um, I was trying to look professional and I had a jacket, but it's really hot, so I'm just gonna let it all hang out. Um, so my name is Benedetta. For the past 10 years, I've been working on trying to tackle real world challenges through open hardware projects, because apparently I love impossible missions. Um, it all kind of started in 2004 when I was sleeping on a beach in um, southern Sri Lanka when the Indian tsunami hit. And that kind of instantaneously transformed me into um, a survivor and also a first responder. So my life has pretty much never been the same after that and it really changed my outlook on things. Um, so after that I decided to jumpstart a couple of businesses focused on open engineering, prototyping, and field testing of uh, solutions for humanitarian challenges, environmental, wildlife conservation, and pretty much just social challenges uh, in general. And um, I also had the pleasure of working as researcher in a couple of different academic institutions um, and consult for different companies. But I've worked on some um, really awesome projects in different parts of the world with uh, a great roster of partners that range from large governments and large humanitarian organizations to NGOs, academic institutions, down to just really awesome individual researchers. Um, there's plenty of challenges for people like us uh, to tackle, and as you can see, there's you know, a full agenda for the next 15 years, and I assume uh, many, many more through the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, so I encourage everybody to, to participate. Um, it all started for me with my super naive attempt in graduate school to understand the process of tsunamis, and I apologize for anybody here that actually has a scientific background. Um, and I wanted to kind of understand the, the process of tsunamis and also understand the workings of like $300,000 uh, piece of equipment, and I wanted to recreate that with $300 worth of hardware. Um, the hardware didn't fail, my math failed miserably, and the project got repurposed into a live performance, and I wish that was a joke. Um, my very first real project uh, for a client was in partnership with UNICEF uh, to explore the possibility of building a network device in order to aid um, uh, community healthcare workers in diagnosing severe acute malnutrition in children in um, rural clinics uh, in Uganda and other parts of Africa. Um, and it was a fantastic experience. It was my first experience in, in the field, um, and it was a huge learning curve. Um, and it gave birth to a lot of other projects that sort of highlighted gaps uh, in the challenge that we were facing and problems that they hadn't really thought of. Um, I've worked on some really kind of out there projects. Uh, we did a Kickstarter campaign that was fully funded uh, to build open source lion tracking collars um, to help conservationists in Kenya who are mediating the conflict between uh, the Maasai herders and lions. Um, and we really wanted to build them tools that were gonna be open source in contrast with the extremely proprietary and prohibitively expensive uh, tools that they use today so that they could actually modify their devices so that they could collect data in whatever format they wanted, they could change the batteries, um, they could attach sensors, and again, this project sort of became a larger platform because we talked to a lot of different organizations and a lot of different researchers needed to track some kind of moving target, for example, vaccines. So this became like more of an open source uh, tool suite. Um, most of the projects that I've been involved in or I am involved in 
they include a lot of kind of whether M2M devices or some type of uh, device that needs to communicate data with the rest of the world. Um, and so I became really interested about five years ago in open source telecommunications in general. Um, and it turns out that it's a lot cheaper and more feasible when there's no infrastructure to even just jumpstart your own cellular network. So I've been really into exploring open source cell networks and I've set up some demo units for, for different clients and I've kind of been geeking out on that ever since. Um, on the infrastructure side, I've worked on projects that had to do with energy, like microgrid shared solar systems, and more recently on a project that's aimed at bringing 24-7 access to clean drinking water in um, rural areas and unstructured settlements in different parts of Africa. And this has been kind of an ongoing project that um, we're working with a fantastic team on and I've been sort of on and off on it for, for years. Um, all throughout these projects, there's a lot of common threads and a lot of common lessons learned with which I think a lot of people have touched on today. Um, there's a lot of them, but um, if I could summarize it to the most important is, one is uh, ask real questions, ask the really hard questions, and uh, trying to get to the bottom of um, a problem without assuming what the problem is or taking for granted what other people have said the problem to be. Fail early and fail often could not be more appropriate for this field of work, um, especially, and somebody had touched on this today, sharing your failures, because sharing your failures in this kind of realm really helps people save resources that they would otherwise spend in remaking your same mistakes. Um, build, building sustainably with locally sourceable parts and also harnessing local talent and local skill is absolutely fundamental for any of these hardware projects in the field to actually live in the long term. Um, I was never blessed with patience, so um, this is something that I'm personally really struggling with and I'm still kind of constantly reminding myself that um, tackling these type of challenges requires years and on-off efforts um, and they don't happen overnight. It's a really long, hard road and success in this type of realm is really more about not giving up and not getting completely jaded and frustrated um, and continuing on. Um, when I first started uh, working on what I on humanitarian projects, people thought I was absolutely insane. Um, since then, things have changed quite a bit. Uh, there's also a lot of organizations are really moving forward on innovation, and they're really starting to understand. Um, good design principles. Um, they might still be shy on uh, spending resources on hardware projects, uh, but they're really big proponents now of open standards and open source tools. Um, the only thing is that your definition of open source might not be their definition of open source. So you still really need to have tough conversations about questions of ownerships and tech transfers and things like that. But it's still, it's, it's moving in the right direction and really open source in terms of hardware solutions is the only way to go in order to make things that are scalable and sustainable, especially when you talk about hardware um, in terms of maintenance and technical training and knowledge transfers. Those are all things that open source really makes possible in these kind of environments. So in order to encourage people to really kind of tackle these type of things, um, I've been teaching classes and workshops around, around these topics. More recently, I taught two classes um, at ITP, one called Towers of Power, which is around GSM infrastructure and how uh, the GSM network works, um, how you can roll your own cellular network, how you can build your own cell phone or your own M2M devices, all using uh, open source software and hardware. Um, and also Network Sensor for Development, which is exactly a class about uh, building sensor networks for humanitarian purposes. Um, I wanted to make the class fun and engaging, but I really wanted students to hit some critical lessons learned that they would normally learn by actually field testing things. Um, so I gave them some very specific design challenges wrapped kind of in a fun way, um, but it was amazing to actually see them hit like 
um, and learn things that in a couple of weeks that I learned after years of being in the field. Um, some amazing projects that took advantage of, of the classes were, for example, Say Cell by Edwin. Edwin uh, started a uh, community uh, cellular network for unserviced areas in Nicaragua. He just uh, he managed to fund this project and also he installed um, a fully functional network um, in um, the most recent one was in Port Lagoon and then uh, he did a previous installation um, in I can't remember, the name escapes me, but he's already done two full installations and he's planning on scaling. Uh, network compass sensors by Kina, um, where uh, a system of uh, compass sensors that were installed in the field, he also wrote a fantastic instructable, um, and they were installed in partnership with different composting sites in New York City. Uh, some of the students really took those design constraints at heart and uh, really focused on making things efficient, open source, and low power. Um, so some focused on indoor quality sensing for households and for health conditions and households in developing countries. Some people built their own um, low-cost water monitoring sensors with recycled materials or, or easily available materials. Um, not all the projects uh, aimed at saving the world, um, but they were still pretty fun. For example, Bed Vibes Desk was kind of a critical look on vibrating notifications that you get on your cell phone and how annoying and disruptive they can be. Or a real handset that allowed you, it was a fully functional cell phone and a glove that allowed you to like make calls with more intuitive gestures and, uh, and speed dial your friends. Um, what I've been really interested in recently, other than teaching and consulting, has been kind of trying to release open source designs uh, for people to really build their own communication tools. Um, and also I'm trying to get back to the root of my interest in this world, uh, in kind of in this field, which is pretty much emergencies. Um, moving forward, I see uh, the open hardware uh, process for humanity to be uh, extremely user-driven, uh, a process that uh, should be shared and very collaborative uh, in order for it to really be locally sustainable and have the type of global impact that I know it can have. And I'm very positive and I feel really strongly about the fact that it's people like you that can contribute and make this vision happen for the future. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Is it just me or is everybody's head kind of spinning with all these stimulating ideas? And uh, like the previous speaker, I think I'm, I've just given in. I'm embracing the perspiration. I think, wasn't it Edison who said it's 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration? We're there. Okay. So I think it was uh, Isaac Newton who made famous the statement, if I've seen further, it's by standing on the shoulder of giants. And the Wright brothers are generally given the credit of creating aviation in this country. With, without them, we'd have no aviation. We'd have no uh, gift of flight in this country and the huge economy and the shrinking of the globe and all the social implications of that. However, I think if we look at the facts, you come up with a, a really more nuanced and interesting picture. Um, and you can ask the question, did the Wright brothers actually do more harm than good to aviation in this country? Were they really the first in flight? Let's look at some of the prior art. And prior art, prior art is defined as um, 
any, any evidence that an invention that you're claiming existed before you. And it, it doesn't need to be physically available. It just needs to be described or shown or, or existing in some way. So Sir George Cayley, in 1804, flew this scale model. It looks crude, but it has a lot of the features of a current day airplane, I think you'll agree. The cruciform tail, he understood the center of gravity, he wrote a, a paper describing the four fundamental forces of flight. In 1853, he built this full-scale glider, towed it with horses, and took a small boy and then his coachman into the air in 1853. And it was inherently stable, it didn't crash, nobody died. His coachman quit, though, he said it was just too frightening. Then in 1868, Matthew Pierswatt Bolton wrote a paper in 1864, and he got a patent in 1868 in Great Britain on specifically ailerons. This was years and years before the Wright brothers, and somehow this uh, patent and his paper were just uh, lost and forgotten for nearly, nearly 50 years. Otto Lilienthal, in 1893, he actually paid to have a 500-foot hill built in his backyard and did over a thousand soaring flights using a glider like this that again, it looks a lot like a modern biplane. Octave Chanute in 1896, he met with the Wrights multiple times and he, they asked him for, he, he'd written a summary of flight, a couple of them actually, um, back before the turn of the century and so the Wrights contacted him as part of their survey of existing technology. He freely shared everything he had. Um, these are a couple of his gliders that he flew off the shores of uh, the south shore of Lake Michigan off the sand dunes there. He did over a thousand glider flights too. J.J. Montgomery received a patent in 1906 for a controllable aer aeroplane device. He didn't have an engine, but he had a, a glider that was controllable in three dimensions. He launched off a cliff, a mesa, near Santa Clara where he worked, and he then took a glider up in a hot air balloon to several thousand feet and then flew off and had flights of 15 minutes or more. And this was all uh, before the turn of the century. Um, and he continued on working after the turn of the century. And a movie, Columbia Pictures made a movie based on his life. Samuel P. Langley, third Smithsonian secretary. He was friends with, all these guys knew each other. He knew Octave Chanute, he knew Alexander Graham Bell. Alexander Graham Bell took these pictures of one of uh, Langley's steam-powered, if you can get your head around that, a 10-foot scale model with a steam engine that flew for over a mile. It was a free-flying model but it was stable, and this is a picture that Alexander Graham Bell actually took himself. When uh, Langley heard about the Wright's efforts, he wanted to meet them. They weren't interested, they declined. He built a full-scale aircraft. You can see here it's a biplane, but with, not, with, with the wings laterally displaced, not stacked up vertically. He, took, he made two attempts to launch it off this uh, huge houseboat that he made, and uh, both failed. They just crashed into the river. Nobody was hurt, fortunately. Um, and then Glenn Curtis, in 1914, took the, the Langley Flyer from the Smithsonian, did what he called minimal modifications, and successfully flew it in, off a lake in upstate New York. The Wright brothers disagreed about how minimal those modifications were. And finally, Gustav Whitehead, believe it or not, in 2013, the Connecticut legislature voted unanimously, signed by the governor, to declare Gustav Whitehead first. Is anybody aware of this? to claim him first in flight, not the Wright brothers, okay? And there's some evidence that he flew this aircraft um, in 1901. So, where, where, where are we all headed with this? Well, the Wright brothers were very organized. They were very methodical. They started with kite testing, glider flights. Um, they came up with a full-scale glider before they tried putting an engine. They just went step by step. This is a, a photograph from 1902. And finally, everybody's seen this picture in 1903. Um, in Kill Devil Hill, um, or Kitty Hawk, rather, North Carolina. Then they got a patent. They applied for that. They received it in 1906, and it was incredibly sweeping. We'll come back to that in a second. Um, they stopped all development at that point. They didn't want to be manufacturers, didn't want to run a company. They would not show their aircraft to the military. They, they quickly realized private individuals probably weren't the customers. They wouldn't even show it to the military unless they signed a purchase agreement first. Not an NDA, a purchase agreement. So they were not particularly open-minded about disclosing anything about their device. The Aerial Experiment Association was started by Alexander Graham Bell, the same person who developed the telephone. He had a huge interest in flight later in life, and they built several aircraft, never used the wing warping technique. 
So the Wrights, in order to, they, they studied buzzards, and when buzzards fly, they twist their wings. And so they built a wing that could be twisted. Well, a wing you want to be rigid and inflexible so that it doesn't fall apart, especially using the materials that they had available, which they didn't have carbon fiber and all these things today that would have made that a little bit easier. But then they had to make their wing flexible and smushable so that they could warp it and achieve control. Well, those two things are at odds with each other, and it was a, a design decision that haunted them forever. Uh, Alexander Graham, Graham Bell heard about a man called Glenn Curtis, and Glenn Curtis started, like the Wright brothers, as a bicycle messenger, a bicycle racer, a bicycle mechanic, started a bicycle company. When the internal combustion engine came out, he developed this 4,000 cc V8 engine, complete from scratch, on his own, shaft drive. You'll notice there's no brakes on this bicycle. He just coasted to a stop, and for about 20 years, he was the fastest man on Earth, 136 miles an hour, faster than a train, faster than a car. Amazing man. So he developed aircraft engines. He had the uh, world market on dirigible engines for the first few years. This is the June bug. Uh, notice how different it is from the Wright Brothers aircraft. For one thing, it has wheels. Their aircraft was launched by a catapult from a wooden skid. They did not add wheels to their aircraft until 1910. So Glenn Curtis, as soon as he started talking about his aircraft, the Wrights wrote him threatening letters because they had a patent. They said, if you try to profit in any way, you owe us a license because we've been granted a patent, not just on our design that uses wing warping, but on the idea of controllable flight, any kind of aircraft, just a huge blanket patent. Anything that flies, we have a patent on, you have to license from us. Glenn Curtis thought that was ridiculous because he didn't steal their ideas, um, and he didn't use the wing warping technique, and he didn't use their engine. He offered to sell him that sell the rights, one of his engines. He had way better engine than they did. His engine put out about, well, his later engines put out 40, 50 horsepower. Theirs put out 12. It was barely adequate. So the Wrights didn't want to compete for any trophies. They wanted to keep everything secret. Curtis, on July 4th, 1908, won the Scientific American Trophy flying this aircraft shown here, the June bug. And there's a picture of him. He looks pretty stern. So the crux of the matter is that Curtis felt that any basic fundamental discovery belongs in the public domain. So the idea of controlled flight, he felt, should be released for the public good. Then if you want to patent a specific propeller design, a specific wing design, a specific engine design, okay, fine, do that. But just the idea of flight, you know, the idea of an engine, the idea of a propeller, those things should not be patentable. The Wrights disagreed. They believed they owned any uh, blanket patent on any sort of three-dimensional um, control of an aircraft. So here's a little bit of comparison. The Wrights never married. Curtis uh, married and raised a family. The Wrights, their first sale of their uh, license was actually to a foreign government. The Wrights did not collaborate well. They sort of pulled information in, like from Octave Chanute, and everybody they collaborated with ended up hating them, because, and especially Octave Chanute felt very abused, because he gave them all this information, all his writings, all his papers, he gathered information from other sources, gave it to them, and then they didn't give anything back to the community. So like a one-way GPL, a GPL with a diode inserted in the front end of it. Um, the Wrights did not have lifelong collaborative partners. Glenn Curtis did. They liked to work in secret. Curtis liked to work in public and so forth. Unfortunately, it was also a Wright flyer that was uh, the aircraft involved in the first aviation fatality in this country in 1908. So the Wrights wrote warning letters. They sued everybody. Curtis sold the first aircraft public in the, in the United States in 1909. They immediately sued him. Exhibitions became really popular. And so the Wrights first would send attorneys to the docks when somebody would come in from out, outside this country with an airplane of their own design, didn't use wing warping, wasn't a copy of the Wrights aircraft, didn't use their engine, and so forth. They would send an attorney to the docks and say, you need a temporary license to operate this aircraft here in the United States. That'll be $1,000, which at the time was about enough money to buy two homes. Um, eventually, they worked out a deal where they got a blanket license. So anybody having a, a flying exhibition in the United States would purchase a blanket license from the Wrights by giving them the first $20,000 of gate receipts, which today is equivalent to about half a million dollars. So every exhibition in this country, the Wright brothers got half a million dollars off the top to allow everybody else to fly their own aircraft of their own design. Glenn Curtis thought this was so crazy that he offered to pay uh, 
or excuse me, Henry Ford thought this was so crazy, he offered to pay Glenn Curtis his legal fees and did so. So this situation became so untenable that prior to the Great War, the U.S. had produced 10 aircraft, and France alone had produced uh, almost 1,400. And of course, other, every other European country had similar. And this is prior to the Great War, okay? So the U.S. government took the incredible step of forcing a resolution to these patent battles by starting the National Advisory Committee on Aeronautics and starting this patent pool in 1917 and forcing every aircraft manufacturer in the U.S. to join. It was not optional. The fee was really nominal. Anybody could afford it. That's the thing. If the Wrights had had a reasonable license fee, you know, nobody would have complained too much, but they wanted a lot of money, and they had the patent to back them up. So finally, this is, there are so many strange things about this story. Here's one of them. So Orville was so annoyed at the Smithsonian because they'd funded Langley. They were trying to say that Langley was first in flight. They gave their aircraft to Glenn Curtis, who then fixed it up and flew it, which would have invalidated the Wright patent and so forth. So they absolutely hated the Smithsonian. So they sent the Wright flyer to Great Britain, where it was in a museum there. Well, finally, the Smithsonian wanted it back in this country. Uh, Wilbur had died already. Orville would not hear of it unless he got an official apology, which the government and the Smithsonian gave him in 1943. And FDR, who had been instrumental in uh, developing the NACA as a, a funded initially by naval funding because he thought the Navy should be involved in aviation. There was a celebration dinner and so forth. World War II got in the way. Orville died in 1948. So nothing happened until 1948 after Orville's death when a secret agreement that just came to light in 2013 was written between the Smithsonian and the Wright estate. Believe it or not, here's some of the text from it. So it says that the Wright estate will give the Wright flyer to the Smithsonian for a dollar if they promise to always have a plaque with these words on it and if you read the bottom paragraph that they will never do any research or question the fact that the Wrights were first in flight. No new info I'm serious. They will, they will look at no new information and if they do, they lose the Wright flyer. It, its ownership reverts back to the, the Wright brothers estate and that's still the case today. So what can we conclude about this? Well, who's going to agree with me just on what we've heard, to, heard just now that the Wright patent was absurd? You know, it was just, it was just wacky. But, you know, as, as, as one of the speakers, was it Ben said, you know, IP will, will kill us, right? Um, and this was a case. It, it destroyed the aviation industry. It set things in the U.S. back about 20 years. We were 20 years behind the rest of the world in terms of aviation. And you have to ask yourself, what if? What if the rights had been collaborative? What if they'd worked with each other? What if they'd taken their ideas, the ideas of the ailerons of Curtis's design and the Aero Experiment Association plus the Curtis engine? We could have led the world, but we didn't. We wound up two decades behind. Curtis, on the other hand, although he did apply for patents, he was much more open, much more collaborative, and he accomplished a lot more. And so Glenn Curtis really doesn't get the credit he deserves for doing uh, aviation development in this country. He really was the Henry Ford of aviation in this country. And then finally, the Wright brothers, uh, they cashed out in 1920. Curtis cashed out in 1920-something. when He became a real estate developer in Florida. And the Wright and Curtis companies merged, believe it or not. These bitter enemies, they formed the Curtis Wright Corporation. They, they built aircraft for World War II. They're still around today. So if you go to the Curtis Wright a company website, that's the company that's made up of this mashup of the Curtis and Wright companies today. And unfortunately, history by decree seems to still be alive and well. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, my name's Tiga Brain and I'm here today and really excited to share with you Unfit Bits. 
Unfitbits is a revolutionary new way of thinking about your fitness data. And it wouldn't have been possible without the open hardware community, so it's a real honour to be here today. And this is my co-founder, Surya Matu. Thanks, Diego. This project is about fitness trackers and the new ways that the data sets they generate are being used. In 2015, there has been a surge in the fitness data tracking market. Up until this point, fitness data has mainly been used by people for their personal use to monitor their own behavior. However, we've recently seen a big expansion of the activity data market by key players such as corporate wellness programs. These are companies who are both brokering employee data, um, insurance companies, and banks who are incentivizing the generation of this data. So just to give you a sense of where this market is going, last year BP, the oil company, bought 25,000 Fitbit devices for their North American employees and offered them discounts on their insurance policies if the employees agree to wear the trackers and log one million steps per year. At the moment, the market for these wearable devices is still relatively small. It's about 2% of the one billion smartphones that are shipped globally every year. So creating interest from employers and insurance companies is key to growth for these tracking companies. And bear in mind that these employment fitness programs means that it's the employees that bear all the risk in terms of the privacy and confidentiality of what are quite personal health and activity data sets. So to give you a sense and a few examples of what's happening in the industry, here's a little clip. Seven is on your side now with a consumer alert. And uh, you see them everywhere these days. Health apps and fitness bracelets that track your steps, your calories, even your sleep. First time we've been able to integrate life insurance with a Fitbit. Opt into this totally optional program and agree to have your physical activity tracked. They will offer you a discount. So one of the things that can get you points is activity. Okay, so... We had a little bit of a problem with the visuals there, but that gives you a sense of one of the programs that I'm talking about. Launched by insurer John Hancock. John Hancock's working in partnership with a company called Vitality, which is one of these fitness data broking companies, and they're offering customers life insurance deals if they wear the freely provided fitness trackers and if they maintain a certain level of activity every year. If we jump over to Russia, Alpha Bank is offering financial incentives such as higher interest rates on their savings accounts. We at Alpha Bank if believe their that real wealth is when you're healthy. And it's known that to be healthy, you need to make 10,000 steps a day. But in a country where each individual strives harder than anybody to give the best to their homes, you need to work hard. So hard that you won't have time left for those magically health-inducing 10,000 steps. We at Alpha Bank refuse to compromise to avoid neglecting either your wealth or health. Мы захотели совместить нудный, неинтересный процесс накопления с тем, что человек делает каждый день. Он ходит. That's why we created activity. It's the, this unique technology that allows people to earn money through their active lifestyle. We mean real money. So the more you move, the more you work. And then, over here in the US, you might have seen these advertisements in the subways where Oscar's offering customers health insurance discounts also in exchange for their activity data. So when we saw all of this, we started thinking about the people who these schemes leave out. So who might be the kind of people who don't get the opportunity to leave their desk? People who may have disabilities and can't move in the same way as the people who are shown in these videos or even people who don't have access to exercise facilities the same way. Think cab drivers, subway drivers, and a variety of other people. Could we develop a platform to disrupt this market and allow everyone to enjoy the benefits of this new technology? So I don't think our video is going to play, so we should just skip on. Should we just launch it again? Yeah. Sorry, just give us a moment. We're having a little bit of problem with the video. Mm -hmm. 
just play the video? Yeah. I'm just going to jump over to the file. Mm -hmm. Unfit bits is for those with Unfit bits is for those with lifestyles that prevent you from qualifying for health insurance discounts. Perhaps you are unable to afford active adventure holidays. Or maybe you just want to keep your personal data private without having to pay more for the privilege. Our researchers have devised a range of simple open source techniques that allow you to free your fitness from yourself. Think about Unfit Bits as your own physical API, allowing you to reprogram your fitness. Our techniques have been researched, analysed, optimised so that you can extract your maximum fitness potential. Free your fitness, free yourself, free your fitness, from yourself. Thank you. We'll persevere with the media yeah, here. Sorry about this. Um. So our aim was to make a fitness data market more accessible to those who are unable to focus on their own personal fitness. And so now we'd like to walk you through our research process behind our new and very exciting platform. What you've seen is where we started, with a suite of easy fitness solutions. We went through an iterative design process and developed some really exciting open source mechanical algorithms for you to ready make your data sets. So tell us, what was the first step, Surya? Well, obviously, Tiga, we analyzed the data. Right, we analyzed the data. So we started with simple um, can... existing fitness trackers. Again, we're having video issues. So bear with us. So we started um, looking at existing fitness trackers. So trackers like the Fitbit and the Jawbone. And we wanted to see what the, actually, what the actual accelerometer data was giving us with our various um, Fitbit solutions. And this actually turned out to be much harder than expected, as these trackers do not make the raw data available to the wearer. In fact, Fitbit actually makes you pay to get the raw data that they collect from your sensor on their website. And the jawbone, this tracker, won't give you the data at all. So given that, we, given that we weren't able to get our hands on the raw data from these trackers, and rather we were only able to see the computed statistics and the results from these algorithms, we conducted an algorithm audit. We tested each solution, comparing accelerometer data from um, an open source tracker with the data from these closed proprietary systems. And we actually found interesting things. There was um, all the, the different trackers worked similarly, but there were some differences. So for example, when we ran the drill experiment, the jawbone tracked 33 steps, whereas the Fitbit tracked 11. So what we could tell was that there was some sort of difference in the filtering and sampling processes of these different trackers. And what we also noticed was when we did the bicycle wheel test, the periodic motion seemed to favor a more consistent step count across a variety of trackers. So as you can see, we live in exciting times because these sensors are still pretty simple and there's lots of opportunity to di disrupt this data market and create products that give users more control over their data profiles. And UnfitBits is the first to take advantage of this new market. And so with this in mind, I'm really excited to introduce our first new product, the Desktop Stepper. 
The stepper was made with the intention to maximize activity and comfort. Not only has the stepper been calibrated to mimic a step from the point of view of most commonly used fitness trackers, its minimal design means it will seamlessly fit into a variety of workplaces with absolutely no friction. We're also excited to announce that our designs are going to be made open source and available from our website next week. And so I can see you thinking, how well does this thing actually work? So what did we do next, Surya? Well, Tika, we analyzed some more data. Right. We analyzed some more data. And we found that a dampening periodic motion. Sorry, we have to. We'll just switch to the <laughs> <Yeah>. video. Apologies. <laughs> I think it's that one. We'll just leave it like that, hey. So we found that a dampened periodic motion was the best combination for ease of use for our clients and customers and fitness data generation. And so enough of all these graphs. The question is, does it actually work with a Fitbit? And as you can see, maybe the video is not clear here. I'll try to like just full screen it for you. <laughs> I don't know how to do this. So that one? Yeah. So we, could, we hope you can see that, but it seems to work very well. The periodic motion of our desktop stepper actually mimics steps perfectly. When we reach a peak on one end of the swing, the Fitbit tracks it as a step. And we've carried this out with a variety of trackers that are already available in the market, and we found some very similar results. So it's our mission at Unfitbits to empower everyone to be able to access financial benefits from their fitness data. So down at our lab, we're trying to see who these people are who need this help. And the first prototype we have is the Smokers Edition, as you can see. So these products are currently available for pre-order on our website. We have prototypes with us here down at the front. And we're also launching a handy guide that gives insight into our design process and our in-depth research. We also want to hear from you. Our community is growing, and we're really excited about the future. Pre-order your freedom today. guys doing? So my name is Pedro. My name is Zudi. Uh, we're here to talk to you about Backslash, which is a series of functional devices designed for protests and riots of the future. The goal of Backslash is to retain the right to connect and protest sites through disruptive innovation and the creative appropriation of existing and open source means. Uh, technology has been uh, playing a very important role in the recent wave of protests from Arab Spring to Occupy Central in Hong Kong. And these technologies can be divided up into two main categories. First, those utilized by the authorities, which consist of sound cannons, water cannons, stingrays, active denial systems, that list can go on and on and it keeps on growing. Uh, and the second group is those appropriated by the protesters, which is made up of various forms of social media and some DIY protection gear. As you can see here, the scales are really uneven. Um, so by now, most people have heard about how the important role played by Twitter and Facebook during the Egyptian uprising, or how Firetrap became the number one network during the protests in Hong Kong. However, through our research, we found one fact to be extremely interesting that really stuck out, which was uh, that 
um, the highest levels of participation during, seen during the Arab Spring Movement uh, were seen during periods of internet and network blackouts. And uh, this happened because uh, besides being young, early adopter, and a digital native, the modern protester really believes that connectivity is a basic human right. So we both come from a design background, and this became a really, really interesting challenge to bring some of these topics to the foreground. And we wanted to uh, create objects and devices that could help start that conversation. Uh, so, and to do so, we created this fully functional and conceptual kit um, for protesters using open source designs and uh, easily accessible parts. Um, and the devices, uh, from the electronics to the enclosures, everything in the kit were devised with two questions in mind. First, how can protesters communicate safely and retain their rights to protest? And second, how can protesters and journalists spread their messages without, uh, while evading censorship and surveillance technologies? So Pedro and I both come from a third world country. So we understand very well that it's kind of impossible to develop a one size fits all solution to all of these dynamic scenarios. Um, not all protests can be like Hong Kong where uh, the average protester had about three devices connected to the internet. So to start, we decided to develop this new computer-generated pattern that was inspired by the traditional kafia, which is still an important symbol of activism. And this way, you can not only protect uh, the identity of the protester, but also could embed and hit a message in it. So if today a young uh, Iranian activist still face a lifetime in prison just for talking to journalists in the protest that followed the election of 2009, maybe in the future, with a bandana and a simple app, they'll be able to communicate with each other and even through a photo, send a message to a journalist from the New York Times. And I know you guys might be thinking this is just a QR code in a piece of cloth, but actually it's not, because a QR code is a two-dimensional barcode, and this way all the information is embedded in it, and this way it will be developed, it will be decoded. But what we develop is a tracker, the hash to the message, just a way, an extra layer of authentication. And here in the top, you can see uh, why you're showing the message number one. If I fold the bandana to the other side, a different message will be displayed. And through the nature of the bandana, I could fold in eight different ways and have unlock eight different messages. Another technique that's pretty common through the authorities and the police is what they call bottlenecking, where they close certain streets so they can funnel the flow of participants so like the activists and, and the protests, they can be beaten or arrested. In 2013, I went back to Brazil, and while joining a protest, I faced many scenarios of extreme police brutality, have use of pepper sprays, rubber bullets, tear gas, and even fire guns. So we decided to develop something that was like a network of wearable devices that could notify if a certain area was under conflict. And the way that this works is if someone is in, like, in a dangerous situation, you just press the button, it's kind of like a panic button, and 10 to 15 blocks before, they will notify others and all these networks so they could avoid certain area. They could find a different path, they could run. I know that uh, local networks are not something new in protest sites. We've been seeing mesh networks in different colors and flavors. Zuri just mentioned fire chat. But what we decided to do is to focus on the hardware. We decided to develop a, a router that was tailor-made for emergency situation, for fast deployment, something that you could just pull the cord and that's it. You could connect even during periods of internet blackouts and cell phone, uh, cell phone tower blackouts. And one thing that's important to, to understand this is this we could also connect to the devices that are already developed and we'd be able to pinpoint in a map even the positions of like conflicts. Uh, all the videos and the photos from protests nowadays, they are user-generated content. Protesters that call themselves a new independent media, registering the abuse of authorities and documenting political events from inside. But aware of these practices and the power that these emails have, sometimes cameras are broken and phones are taken by oppressive forces. 
So what do we decide to develop here is a Wi-Fi enabled drive that people can just upload their photos and connect in which they strip all the metadata. So nobody can track you down, nobody can have this. And even if your phone or camera are taken, you still can register and have this documented. It's kind of like your personal black box for a protest. Another item that we decide to add to the kit, it's this uh, collection of stencils that was first inspired by this old activity from like 2002, the called war chalking. People used to mark down in the pavement like Wi-Fi hotspots. So we decided to combine this idea with the technology that we developed for the bandana. And this way you can mark urban environments and can tell, oh, you should not use your phone here. You have like a heavy use of surveillance or even like Stingray, which is like cell phone tapping. And the way this works is kind of the same as the bandana. We'd be able to, to scan and Quickly, they'll tell you, oh, you, should, you shouldn't be using this, you should be aware. Cell phones became important tools for protesters, even called by some a tool of a revolution. But aware of this, and also that the power of, of these phones have, and protesters are being tracked down, and they become easy targets for possible retaliation. During the protests in Sochi, Activists and even civilians that are just close to a certain area of protest, they have the information tracked by Wi-Fi antennas and scanners, and later the state will track them down. So what do we decide to develop here is a personal and localized small radius Wi-Fi jammer and cell phone jammer. And this way, they block all the communication that you have from your phone, and nobody can connect from inside and outside. But you can still use all your features of your camera, and you can record, you can still register the protest. So here in the top, you can see I'm showing all the, the network that are connected at NYU and the floor that we develop. And once I click the button, one by one, all those channels are being blocked to the point that nobody can track my phone anymore. And if I click, I'm back and I can connect it again. I think at this point it's important to mention that we don't have a political agenda. We are not red or yellow. We are not pro-China, Hong Kong. But uh, the heavy use of technology against the protests really made us think, in the future, how would the underground find back? We believe that in the future of protests, the technology protest site is dark. India just started to test uh, drones mounted with pepper spray, and North Dakota just passed a law they're going to be able to do the same with tasers. We didn't start backslash thinking we'd be able to find solutions for all these problems, and we are far from doing that. But we truly believe that Hackerspace, Fab Lab, and even communities like this are a good space to start. We are here to start this conversation. So let's talk. Hi, so uh, I'm Tom, I teach at ITP, and I'm also one of the co-founders of Arduino, and normally when I do presentations, um, a lot of my presentation uh, MO is to sort of gush about my students' work. Uh, the last three or four presentations were my students' work, so I can't do that now. Um, but uh, obviously I'm very proud of you guys. Um, what I want to talk about today is, is kind of new material and it's a little half-baked, so please bear with me. I want to talk about the role, uh, as we've been saying, about the role of open hardware, and uh, I want to think a little bit about where we might uh, head and some of the dynamics uh, that are worth looking at. Um, you know, we did a great job coming up with a definition for open source hardware, and uh, I think the, the progress that, that Oshawa has made has been great, but I also think that it's worthwhile um, to keep in mind that it's worthwhile to sort of uh, question your religions a bit. Uh, I suppose I shouldn't say that in a church. Um, my old boss, Red, uh, used to constantly, uh, when I asked her what we were doing, is it new media, is it emerging media, whatever, she would often say, it's too soon. And, you know, 10 years into it, I was like, can we give it a definition yet? She's like, it's too soon. And, you know, I think it was an important point she was making because while definitions allow us to identify things and, and really clarify what we're talking about, they also give us permission to persecute heretics by saying, no, you're not following the definition. So I think one of the things we have to do is be very careful about how we manage um, the definitions we work with. 
Um, there's an old joke that what's the worst thing that can happen to a revolutionary? And the answer is he wins. Uh, because it's a whole lot easier to call for change than it is to implement it. And uh, this talk is really kind of about how we might survive winning uh, if we see ourselves as revolutionary. Um, when I started teaching physical computing uh, in 97, uh, I could teach students how to make microcontroller-based devices that sensed and responded to the physical world, and I could stop there uh, because that's all they really wanted. And that's no longer possible. Now, anybody coming to this stuff, anybody who's even aware of it, knows that if a device has power, it talks to another device, and they want to learn how to do that. So at this point, communication is as central to the devices we make as sensing and controlling the physical world. Um, I think that one of the most powerful uh, skills that we can learn is to make graceful transitions between incompatible protocols. In other words, we all really have to learn to speak in tongues. Um, as I say, we've been doing a pretty good job with uh, the definition, but I think the definition we have standing right now for open source hardware, in a way, is kind of more suited to those 1995-97 classes than to 2015. And so maybe what we need to explore is what that definition might look like uh, as communications increasingly define the functionality of our devices. And so I've been doing some background reading on this kind of thing. Let's talk a little bit about some of the standards that we use today, like USB and Wi-Fi, GSM and LTE, and perhaps Zigbee. And the list goes on and on, right? And these standards are managed and influenced by different types of bodies. There's basically three classes of organizations that uh, affect standards. Um, first of all, there are uh, NGOs like the ISO or IEEE or ITU, along with uh, national and regional standards bodies like NIST. Um, there are regulatory bodies like the FCC and the CE certification in Europe. Um, and then there are trade alliances like the Bluetooth.org, uh, Wi-Fi Alliance, uh, USB, and Zigbee. Now that first group uh, generally works on common definitions of standards and the second provides legal limitations of the applicability of standards and then the third really markets them to a wider audience to, to simplify it a bit. Um, standard organizations are useful because they provide, and I'm talking about the NGO types here, because they provide professional review, they, they give us a history of our protocols, um, and they let us see the connections between seemingly disparate or unusual protocols. Um, for example, I actually didn't realize until I started doing a little background reading on this that Bluetooth was part of the same IEEE 802 group as Ethernet, Zigbee, and Wi-Fi. Um, and maybe this is one of the reasons they play nicely together in, in radio spaces, although I'm sure that Surya can give us a few examples of other reasons. Um, you know, regulatory bodies, when they work, represent the interests outside the commercial realm. And uh, as we've seen with the FCC in the 21st century, they don't often work that way anymore, um, mostly because of the amount of commercial power that, that influences uh, elections, particularly in the US. Um, but I think it's worthwhile to recognize that ideal and to try and work towards it. Um, and I have to give Chairman Tom Wheeler props because it took guts for a guy who was a formal cable in industry lobbyist to stand up and say that Title II of the FCC was worth enforcing to ensure net neutrality. Now, we still got a long way to go, but for somebody to turn their position around like that, I think is, is something we should see as a hopeful sign. Um, even though they're not perfect, we can use uh, regulatory bodies to represent non-commercial interests, to represent the public as they're supposed to do. Now, trade alliances like USB and, and uh, the Wi-Fi Alliance and so forth are branded consortia of companies, right? They're, they're, they've got a commercial interest in making interoperable devices, and they've got a commercial interest in, as companies, being able to cooperate where they normally compete with each other. Um, if you think about it, an alliance that has no major players is not really that worth joining because you need that economic power to make it worthwhile. Um, they're also kind of easy to confuse sometimes with the NGA, uh, NGO organizations because they'll try and make their own standards and of course they go back and forth between uh, those two types of groups. Uh, again, uh, 802.11.1 I think it is, is Bluetooth and yet it's been sort of abandoned by IEEE. Um, Trade alliances generally charge fees for, for certification, as, as you know, and if you think about the Wi-Fi Alliance, for example, it's about 15000 a year to join, and that gives you the right to get a product certified, which is going to cost you another few thousand. Now, first of all, that's a, a bit of a limitation, as we know, but 
that limitation goes a little further when you start to look at the licensing for uh, some of these things because uh, ultimately what certification is looking for is to make sure that when something is certified it works exactly as advertised. Now that, that may to, uh, to people like us seem like uh, an insult and it might seem like a, a, an unacceptable limitation but for the general consumer if it works as advertised it's not a bad thing. Um, and it gets to something I think that we need to start considering uh, as part of the Open Source Hardware Association is that thus far we've been working largely uh, on devices for other developers, other tinkerers, uh, for people to learn with, to teach with, and I think that's great. But we need a wider audience for this to really have impact. And partially what that means is we need to reach an audience that doesn't care about tinkering, that doesn't care about hacking, that doesn't care about developing, that just wants things to work. We need to come up with a rationale and prove that open source hardware actually makes things work better. And that's something that I think is going to take a little work. Um, I think one of the questions we also need to consider is looking at these three types of organizations, uh, you know, uh, NGOs and the trade alliances and, and uh, regulatory bodies. We want to ask the question, of what do we want OSHA to be? Which of these three? Or is it a combination of, a, of them all? Because when they all work together, their interests conflict and compete, and hopefully they, they reach a point of balance. Now, standards are only so good as much as they're recognizable for the audience, right? And so back to my point about reaching a consumer audience, your non-nerd family members probably don't know the difference between 802.11, BG, and N, and A, and they don't care. But they sure know what Wi-Fi is. And you can thank the Wi-Fi Alliance for that, um, for better or for worse. Um, and like I say, this is something we've got to really consider. Um, I think it's going to be a tough sell in a way to get across this idea that hardware works better because even if we look at the open source software world where we have a mature and I think reasonably well designed operating system, particularly in some of the, the distributions of Linux, uh, I still can't find a designer, for example, who voluntarily uses Linux. In fact, I can't find a voluntary user of Linux outside of programming and law. So uh, I'm, if you've got examples of those, I would love to have them. Um, yeah, OK, you count. But at the same time, you're also a developer. Um, nice try. <laughs> so let's take a hypothetical product that we all wish existed. And I'm going to sort of examine it from a standards point of view. I'm going to go down the FPGA rabbit hole here a bit. So forgive me. Um, at the physical layer and the, and the media address layer, uh, many of these protocols, as I said, are very similar. And there's always been the call for uh, the sort of holy grail of a well-implemented software-defined radio device and development environment that lets you just switch between protocols like that. Um, I think it's something that also we'd want to have some really nice UX around so that it's easy to think about from a design point of view. Um, it would also have a nice high-level high API so we could design in it. We might maybe call it something like SDR Arduino. Um, this is all technically possible. Uh, and it would certainly make things like the work that Pedro and Zudi were just showing a whole lot easier to develop. It would make the stuff that Surya is working on a whole lot easier to do. Um, but the biggest hurdle, of course, is getting through certification. Uh, and you might say, well, we don't bother with certification. We just make the thing and sell it. But again, the problem is going to be, if you do that, it's very hard to spread it far and wide. You make this tool that can be opened up for a non-technical audience, but then you can't promote it to a non-technical audience. How do you get around that? Um, I don't have an answer yet, but I think coming up with challenges like that, those things that we, we can't see how to get around, is actually a good thing to do, because then we can identify them and then tackle them and make them happen. So that's challenge one, number one for me. I think we also need to. Uh, start to think about these bodies that I'm talking about, not as monoliths, but as, as things made up of people, um, and getting involved in them. Uh, some of you may have seen the recent uh, FCC uh, proposed rulemaking around uh, Wi-Fi firmware, uh, router firmware. It's ET docket number 15-170, uh, in case you want to look it up, and it's still open for public comment until November, October, hint, hint. Um, basically, it says that if you're selling commercial routers, you're not allowed to mo modify the firmware period. Uh, kind of a problem. And it's something that I think if we allow those things to go by, uh, we start to gradually lose ground everywhere. So it may take more than just our own agency, 
our own organization, it may take volunteering and getting involved in some of these other organizations, commenting, showing up at meetings to make that happen. Um, if we don't, it ultimately means that open hardware projects really end up being very expensive hobbies for us and not something that's part of everyday life and improving it. So that's the uh, speaking in tongues part of thing. I, I want to talk a little bit about the old cliche that you catch more uh, flies with honey than with vinegar. Now lately there's been some interest in open source hardware coming from a lot of the larger manufacturers. I've, I've heard uh, folks from Intel, Samsung, Microsoft, Sony, and a few others showing up to talk about it. And these organizations come with a lot of baggage. Um, and that baggage is actually similar to the baggage of regulatory bodies. Um, they're used to doing things a particular way. They do things slowly. They've got their own culture. And it's, frankly, a pain in the butt to work with them. Um, but there are ways around that, and there are people within them to make it work. Uh, for example, Seth Hunter, who I think is here somewhere, Seth, hi, uh, recently set up an open source advisory panel for uh, Intel and invited Alicia and a few of us other uh, to visit. And you know, the first visit was really great and eye-opening for me because it was, I was astounded to see how many people within Intel were not only receptive to open source hardware, but were saying, oh yeah, we do that. And you know, of course, my reaction was, well, no, you don't, it doesn't mean the definition. Uh, but you know, the answer is, yeah, they do, in their own culture and in their own way. And it's certainly open to the developers that they have been working with. Um, that's kind of an important point that everybody's definition of these things is a little bit different. And somebody mentioned it earlier too. I think we have to be a little more flexible in order to expand the umbrella of people that are all agreeing on these things. We might have to have some of these debates within companies. Um, Intel looks differently to, at, at open source hardware because for them, anything you make of less than 100,000 is a prototype. And so that changes the way you make things. But again, when there are people inside of an organization who want to make change, you've got a chance to change it. And I think that's a great thing to say. Um, it also, you have to be very patient with these things because if you think about it, getting a company like that to go into open source hardware is a bit like when you take 50,000 of your friends and you say, hey, where do you want to eat lunch? You know, it takes a while to get everybody to the same place, maybe years. Um, but company operating practices are not handed down on stone tablets from God. You know, they evolve over time in an organization and there are people and points of leverage, as I say. Ultimately, all these organizations, as I'm talking about, like I say, they're open to us. They're just made up, quite frankly, of many of us. So a few final points moving forward. Number one, whether hardware is open or closed, it's of little value if it can't talk to other hardware. Number two, an ability to translate between communications protocols is a critical sp skill, and I don't just mean technically, I also mean culturally. Number three, interoperability is essential. It's got to be foundational, and it requires standards. And unfortunately, standards inevitably lead to standards bodies, and standards bodies leads to political discussions, and we've got to engage in those. The future of open source hardware really depends on accessible, not just open standards, but accessible standards. Um, number four, Again, organizations are changed by people, both inside and outside of them. So if you want to change, you've got to get involved. And finally, in all of this, I think we need to really default to an attitude of patience, of kindness, and empathy, uh, because that's ultimately how we're going to make change happen. So I'll stop there and say thank you very much. everyone to use the mic and then I almost forgot. Hi, uh, my name is Max Whitney. I'm the Vice President of Engineering at Noom. I am an AV geek, uh, but for this context, I am also the review chair for the summit. And so I wanted to say very, very briefly just a couple of words about how we got to the amazing presentations that you saw today. Um, I really want to thank everyone here in the room and out in the wider world who submitted a proposal. We saw almost 60 proposals. I want to really, really thank all of the reviewers. So we had almost 30 reviewers, that is to say we had exactly 29 reviewers, who were experts in academia, industry, in hacker, maker, builder, and designer communities. Um, almost half the proposals were actually rated as accept or strong accept, because this is how academic double-blind peer reviewing is. It's like, yeah, do it. No, really, we mean really do it. 
Um, the program team winnowed that down to 20 presentations which hit on the key themes that you heard today. So the program group was just amazing and really thinking hard about everything that was accepted and then crafting the presentations. And so I want to ask you all to just thank the people who came and presented today and did such great work. And So that brings me to my ask, which is to start thinking about next year's summit. So we're going to be looking for your best ideas again, and we're going to be looking for reviewers again. So if you know even in this moment that you'd like to help us out by being a reviewer, send a note to summit-talks at oshawa.org, and we'll start gathering those names now. Uh, finally, I want to thank uh, Zach Manigakis, who you saw managing slides today, but who managed our entire internet presence through the entire period, and he's just been great. <laughs> and finally, last but certainly not least, the amazing Summit co-chairs um, who, who really made this whole thing happen, Dustin Roberts and Aggie. <laughs> Addie Wagonneck. So come on up. And thank you, Max. Woo. Oh, so there's booze downstairs. What? There's booze downstairs. There is booze, and it's free. Thanks to our sponsors once again. Thank you guys so, so much for coming. If you want to become an Austria member and support the community more and support the summit, uh, we have a table in the sponsorship area. Please go, it just takes a second to sign up. Uh, we have booze, videos, and slides will be up in the next two weeks online and we'll put those on our Twitter account. So again, thank you guys so much for coming. It's an awesome event and it's great to see all your faces again this year. We'll see you next year, same time-ish, new place. Yeah. No.